All right, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever you happen to be watching this video. This is going to be a single long form example exploring how um, to work through some tributary area and low distribution calculations in a bit more complex uh, example than we've looked at previously. Uh, we did do some basic examples of uh, tributary area calculations, both one-way and two-way slabs in the previous lecture. But right now, uh, in, today, in this video, we're going to work on um, just one long form example that explores some of the intricacies of working with more complex floor systems. So this is really going to be uh, one problem, but there's going to be two components of it. And I will explain this now. So let me go ahead and lay out the problem. So uh, we have a floor slab. A floor slab will carry uniform um, live load. A uniform live load. Of 50 PSF. So this is our first given. Oh, what else? Uh, let's see. And then we know some things about the slab. Uh, the slab, or, uh, in the previous examples, I've used concrete. Uh, to mix it up a bit, I'm actually going to use uh, wood as a material this time. Um, so we're going to say the slab is some sort of mass timber. Um, and if I'm say, I'm, we're going to say that it is uh, 8 inches thick. 8 inch thick mass timber. Uh, 8 inch thick mass timber slab. Um, Douglas fir, and that's not going to be too important for the uh, uh, for the actual calculations we're doing here. This isn't a wood design course, but what is going to matter is the specific gravity of this. The specific gravity of this slab is relatively light at 0 0.50, which is a, a reference value for Douglas fir. Um, and so the floor slab is supported by beams. And I'll go ahead and draw this out. And these beams are as follows. These beams are going to be 8 inches wide and 16 inches deep. 8 inches wide and 16 inches deep. And these are also going to be made of Douglas fir wood. And uh, again, the actual strength of the material isn't going to matter for this problem. All we need to know, all you need to know for this uh, for this problem is that this is made of a material with a specific gravity equal to 0 0.5. That's what's going to matter for this calculation. And then uh, the beams, we're not going to use a, com a combination beam girder system for this. This is going to be more of a two-way loading problem. And so the beams are going to rest directly on columns. And the columns will be as follows. Although we won't actually necessarily end up needing this in the process, but just for completion, I wanted to list what the columns are as well. These are going to be square columns, 16 inches by 16 inches. And these are also made of Douglas fir. And so these wouldn't be made, I mean, so, so as far as what these would actually be, these could be any number of things. Um, they could be solid timber if you had some really big 16 by 16 columns. Um, you can, uh, for quite a lot of money, find those. Uh, um, I don't know where you'd find those, but you can find those for uh, the right price if you're really looking for that. But uh, 16 by 16 is really getting up there. More realistically, this would be something like, a, I don't know, a CLT element or maybe a big old glue lamb or something like that. But anyway, and even that's a little, little iffy on that. But uh the beams would definitely be glue limbs and then um, glue lambs, and then the columns would be some other mass timber. So anyway, the actual material, whether steel or concrete, this is just elementary structural analysis, so or basic structural analysis. So the actual strength of the materials is not going to be a factor here. All that's really going to matter is the dimensions and the uh, actual weight of the materials. Okay. So uh, once you get this, go ahead and copy this down, and we are then go I'm then going to draw out. Uh, the floor system itself, and we can we can then uh, work through that. All right, let's go ahead and lay out the floor system. 
and this is going to be interesting because this is actually a um this is a four bay uh floor system however it's actually going to be highly asymmetric although this may not be the scale so let's see it needs to be a bit longer than it is deep so we got so we got that and then the dividing line should be something kind of like this and then like this and we're going to have nine columns like so and i'll lay this out and then i will list all of the dimensions all right so dimensions this is going to be 16 feet this is 24 feet uh this is 20 feet and this is 16 feet so we have one square element and the rest are rectangular to one degree or another and then um, in terms of column labels these are going to be important we have uh, column a b c d e f g h and i and uh just a few more columns and i'd have my full abcs okay so this is all still in the given section of the problems. This is a, a quite involved problem if you could if you could not tell already. And so I want to I want to know two things. Uh, so we have our givens now and find there are two things I'm going to be looking for. One, uh, I want to determine the load diagram, uh, the combined dead and live load diagram. So I'm going to lump them all together and also service level, so we're not considering any load combinations yet. The combined service level, uh, service level, load diagram uh, for beam, uh, that is beam EF. And then also on this one, uh, you may neglect, uh, you may neglect, live load reduction if applicable for the beam. Which we are going to do because this because figuring out the beam is complex enough. And then two, we want to find the overall axial load on column E. On column E, but do not uh, neglect live, road, uh, live load reduction. So we'll be looking at that uh, in that uh, we will be checking column E, looking at its uh, tributary area, just seeing if live load reduction does apply to that member. And if so, we will be applying it to it. All right, so we have our column layout. We Okay, in case this isn't clear, we have nine columns, columns A through I. We have all the dimensions. Note that only one of these bays is square. The rest of them are uh, rectangular in one way or another. Also, um, note that there are beams between all of the columns. So there is a full square grid of columns. And so uh, the tricky thing about this is that we are looking for, uh, especially uh, beam EF is gonna be tricky. And the reason for that is that, think about this. Um, this is definitely going to be a case of two-way loading because um, we don't really have girders. That's a good. That's a a good giveaway that you're not dealing with a you're dealing with a two-way loading versus one-way loading. And also remember our rule of thumb from a previous lecture. Our rule of thumb was that if uh, if the uh, aspect ratio of a slab exceeded two, in other words, the length was twice that of the width, or the, the dimension in length was twice that of the width. Uh, then you could use a uh, uh, one-way slab. And the highest ratio here is 24 over 16, which is less than two. So all of these are going to be two-way slabs. But the really tricky part is that uh, if you think about it, this will, uh, on this side, it will have a maximum tributary width in the middle here of 10 feet, beaming EF will. But on this side, it will have eight feet. So that does add a few interesting complications. But don't worry, uh, we will go through them 
Uh, I specifically designed this problem to create some complex loadings, and we will be looking at it as we move through. So we have all our givens, we know what we're looking for, and then let's begin. All right, so I've gone ahead and drawn a reduced version of our floor diagram that we can reference as we go along. Um, hopefully you have this in your notes, but uh, otherwise, uh, I do, as we go through, I just do want to have a little reference as we move along. So our first step is going to be to, deter uh, to uh, determine some basic loads. Namely, uh, the first thing I want to find is the dead load of the slab. The slab dead load First, I want to determine the slab dead load, and that's just going to be a simple application of specific gravity and volume. So we have an eight inch thick slab, and we need to convert that from inches to feet. So one foot divided by 12 inches, uh, then times the specific, the specific weight of water, because we weren't given the actual, uh, the actual uh, specific weight of the material, we were given just its uh, specific gravity, which of course is its ratio compared to water, and that is pounds per cubic foot, and then times its specific gravity of 0 0.5, and if I multiply that out correctly, I get a uh, an area weight of 20.8 pounds per square foot. So that's going to be, again, that is the self-weight of the wooden slab itself. Um, then, uh, let's see, after that, um, let's go ahead and get the slab weight plus the live load. And we're going to need to use this when creating, this is going to be one of our primary numbers when creating the uh, load diagram for, for beam EF here. And so I want to get the slab dead weight uh, plus the live load. And remember in the problem statement, we were told that we could ignore uh, or neglect live load reduction. Uh, for uh, beam EF. Although truth be told, when you're doing design, um, you can always neglect live load reduction if you want. Um, although I guess sometimes there may be some weird uh, checkerboard loading cases, but uh, let's not worry about that now. That's a bit beyond the scope of this exercise. <laughs> Quite beyond the scope of this, this exercise. So P, our pressure load that's going to be applied across the area we're considering, is going to simply be the sum of our slab dead weight plus our live load. So we have the slab dead weight of 20.8 pounds per square foot plus the live load value we were given of 50 PSF. And this then comes to uh, 70.8 pounds per square foot. And that's gonna be the main pressure load we're applying across our areas that we, when we consider uh, tributary areas. All right, so we have the pressure that we're gonna apply across any tributary areas that we consider. And now we just need to uh, first consider our tributary areas. And the tricky thing about this is because these slabs are not, because these uh, two different bays, the bay EFHI and bay BCEF, because they're not the same dimension, we actually need to consider them, se uh, consider them separately. So if these were exactly the same, in other words, if they were both 24 by 16, for example, we could just calculate the load on the beam on one side and double it. Unfortunately, we can't do that because I've created this wonderfully evil problem. So we need to go and consider them separately. Um, but really the whole point of this uh, video is to show how you handle something a little more complex than a basic example. So let us consider bay uh, BCEF. In other words, we're talking about B, C, E, F, and I'm gonna find what portion of that uh, bay there is going to be up, uh, applying load to beam E, F. So we have the bay here, and I'll go ahead and label the columns. We have column B, column C, column E, and column F. So we're, again, we're trying to find the load on beam E, F. And in terms of dimensions, uh, in this dimension, it is 20 feet, and in this dimension, it's 24 feet. Uh, actually, I'll put that on the top, I think. So I can put a few more dim lines on this. So up here, we're at 24 feet. 
And if we recall back to the rules of two-way slab uh, uh, tributary area distribution, we're going to go out at 45 degree angles until we end up with kind of a envelope looking diagram. A very crudely one rendered one at best. Okay. So, and the reason I know that this side, this side EF is going to have the trapezoidal one is because that is the longer dimension. The shorter dimension is going to be the triangular one and the longer dimension is going to be the uh, trapezoidal one. Now, um, I know these triangles are going to uh, be uh, half of 20 feet on one of their sides. So half of 20 feet, of course, is 10 feet. And these are uh 45 degree triangles so we're going to have dimensions like this and this is definitely not to scale but that's okay for this is just a for illustration purposes so if this is 10 feet this is also going to be 10 feet which is the horizontal distance from here to here and then um this is going to be this middle distance is simply the difference uh, left over or the remainder 24 minus uh, 10 minus 10 of course is simply five feet so I'm going to draw a load diagram, um, and then you can see this here. Um, I'm going to label this beam EF load, load diagram, uh, from, oh, if I can, if I can manage to write the word from properly, not for, from. Uh, from slab uh, BCEF. From slab BCEF. And let me show you what this is going to look like. This will then look like, this will then, um, okay, so uh, we need to, we'll have to calculate the uh, actual load, but the shape of the load diagram on, um, from a single side is going to be the same kind of general shape as the tributary area. Because all we have to go from tributary area to load, all we do is multiply by the applied pressure. So it shouldn't surprise us that uh, if we multiply a shape by a constant, we get the same general shape. So here we would have beam. Um, this would be beam, again, EF, E on this side, F on this side, and we'll have a kind of trapezoidal load. And this would all be vertical load, so I'll draw these with downward uh, with downward lines, uh, or downward uh, yeah downward uh, line loads. And in terms of dimensions, the dimensions here are going to be exactly the same. Uh, the breakpoints are going to be exactly the same as what we have on our load diagram, our our, uh, our tributary area map up there. So this is going to be ten feet, ten feet. And four feet again, not in any, not in any way to scale, but I want to I want to be clear that we can see where I want to make very clear that this is a trapezoidal area, and so uh, I want to make sure, even though it's not to scale, that I would rather it not be to scale than me not to be able to see the uh, dimensions and such. Okay, so we do need the peak value though, and this is relatively straightforward. We know the maximum width of this tributary area is ten feet. So therefore, the maximum load on this diagram is going to be 10 feet times the pressure we're working with, which is 70.8 PSF, which multiplying those together gives us a peak line load of 70, uh, well, that would be, uh, uh, that ends up with uh, 708 pounds per foot. just 70.8 times 10, and we get 708 pounds per foot as the maximum load, um, as the maximum line load on the trapezoidal area here. And again, this is not the entire load on beam EF. This is the load diagram only from the load on EF from slab BC EF. All right, so we figured out the load diagram um, on beam EF from bay BC EF. Now we just need to figure out the, uh, or next we need to figure out the load diagram on beam EF from uh, bay EFHI. And that's what we're gonna do, uh, that's what we're gonna do next. 
So uh, let's go ahead and draw the tributary area of the uh, tributary area map of Bay EFHI. All right, so Bay EFHI. Oh, will be as follows. Let's see, this is going to be a much longer relative one. And we're going to have uh, beam or column E here, column F here, uh, column H here, and column I. Then in terms of dimensions in the horizontal direction, it's going to run from the, for the same 24 feet. And in the vertical direction, it's going to run in the same 16 feet. So we can apply the same uh, right angle rules. This is not going to be to scale, but that's okay. So we know that the vertical distance on this line is going to be eight feet from here to here. So that means it's going to be eight feet to our uh, to the intersection point of the two 45 degree lines. And same thing here with a, therefore a distance of, uh, therefore a distance of eight, of 24 feet altogether will result in eight feet, eight feet, and eight feet. So this diagram is incredibly out of scale, but that's okay, this is just an exercise. So basically we're going to have a, uh, we'll have the middle eight feet of the beam, or sorry, the middle eight feet of the slab, giving all of its area in, um, all of its uh, load in two-way loading, to beams EF and HI, and then on the eight feet either side, it, the load will be uh, split up in a triangular arrangement in two-way loading. Okay, so then I wanted to go ahead and get the uh, beam EF uh, load diagram again from um, Bay EFHI, and we'll go ahead and label that. Uh, actually, I'll do it up here. So I have, I'm going to have, uh, let's see, uh, let's say beam EF load from a bay EFHI. And we end up with another trapezoid, uh, another trapezoidal load arrangement. Again, just multiplying our, and to get the peak value, we just multiply the maximum width, which is going to be eight feet, times our uh, pressure load that we're applying to the entire slab. So, dimensions again are going to be eight feet, and eight feet, and eight feet, and we'll have a series of downward load lines on this. And uh, so eight feet, eight feet, and eight feet, and our maximum value is going to be eight feet times our uh, our area or our overall pressure, which is the same seventy point eight uh, psf. And if I multiply that correctly, that then comes to five hundred and sixty-six point four, not pounds per square foot, but pounds per foot. We have that line load there. Okay, so we now have determined the uh, load diagrams for both the, uh, on, we've determined the individual load diagrams on beam EF from both bay BCEF and bay EFHI. And there's one other load diagram, uh, sort of uh, uh, one other uh, building load diagram, intermediate load diagram we need to get before we uh, get the overall final load diagram. Uh, for beam EF. And that load diagram is going to be the, uh, the load diagram from beam EF's own self-weight. Um, I didn't want to neglect the self-weight of this beam, so I am going to include that in um, the overall load diagram, so that'll make things interesting. Um, so now, a uh, plot load diagram. on beam EF, on the same beam EF here, for 
from its own self weight. Its own self weight. And this is going to be a constant load. That shouldn't surprise us. Uh, this is going to be a prismatic beam. It has the same constant. It has the same cross section all the way its long its length. So therefore, any plot of its uh, self weight versus length is going to be a constant value as you go across. We just need to calculate the beam weight. And the beam weight. Okay, so we have dimensions: uh, 16 inches by uh, eight inches, and then we convert, we divide by 12 twice to convert the units. Then we multiply by the same 62.4 and 0 0.5. And our load diagram is just going to be a simple uh, rectangle instead of a trapezoid, and it will be a constant value across the length of the beam. So, oh, maybe I'll label this E and F to be clear what beam we're talking about. And we have the exact same E, F here, except we're dealing with a constant load, like so. And that value, if you do go and uh, if I multiply that correctly, I get a value, uh, let's see, what was that, of 27.7 pounds per foot. And again, this represents the self-weight of the beam, of beam EF. All right, so now all we have to do is combine all these together. We have three load diagrams, and they're actually all of three different shapes with different critical points. So this is going to be interesting to combine these together. So uh, to plot these, I want to, I think I'll first erase the board and then redraw these. So thanks to the magic of television. All right, so we have these three load diagrams. And what we need to do is we need to merge them together into one. Now, um, it's important to keep in mind that we don't have three separate load cases, like this one is being applied, and then this one is being applied, and then this one is being applied. This is all the same beam. This is all beam EF. These are the three load diagrams we got. This one, again, is the load from uh, the upper slab on beam EF. This one is the... the uh, and by upper slab, I mean slab E, C, E, F. Uh, this one is the load from this uh, lower slab here. And this is the load uh, from the beam itself, just beam uh, E, F's own self weight. So all three of these are acting together simultaneously. And how we combine these together is the principle of superposition. And this is something you may have uh, learned of, hopefully, um, linear superposition. And uh, this is a very uh, fancy way of saying um, something relatively simple, at least in this context. Uh, that is saying that as long as our system is going to remain elastic, as long as we are not going to be exceeding the elastic stresses um, or the elastic yield stresses or whatever it might be, um, you're not going to, or you can simply add together the loads and the system will behave the same way. What I mean by that is uh, a beam, uh, you, you can consider it as three separate uh, sub beams. And uh, if you wanted to find the total deflection, you can just add all the loads together and apply them on a single beam. So we have a couple ways of doing of combining these together. What I want is a final map that illustrates any key changes in slope and any locations and any critical values. And we have a couple ways we could do that. We could get like equations for these. We could get piecewise equations, um, or we could uh, you know piecewise equations and add them together. Uh, at making sure they have the same transition points. But I think I'm just going to do this pseudographically and realize to plot, I'm going to need a few key things. To plot, I'm going to need a few key things. I'm going to need, uh, the one, the min load. Our load is never going to be zero, because even when these trapezoids go down to zero, we're still going to have that 27.7 uh, pounds per foot. So the min load, and that one we already have, that's the 27.7 pounds per foot. Uh, so that's the first thing we need. Second, we need our um, the max load, which occurs at the center, uh, which will be at the center. And then we need a load at another critical point, and that's going to be eight feet from the left-hand side or the right-hand side. 
See, this load here, uh, this middle trapezoid stops increasing before this middle one does, or this upper one does. And so there's going to basically be a change of slope in the load diagram. So we need to find, so if we want to run all the statics on this and we're not um, calculate stresses and deflections and such, we would need to have the load at that critical location. So we need the uh, load at uh, x equals 8 feet, 8 feet from the end of the beam. Okay, so let's go ahead and get these. Uh, well, we already have the first one. Then the max load, well, that's simply going to be the summation of all of the maximum values. So this is going to be, uh, let's see, we have uh, 788, or sorry, 708, not 788, if I can get my numbers straight. So 708 pounds, uh, pounds per foot, plus 566.4, um, plus our uniform self-weight load of 27.7. And if I summed all these correctly, I get a final peak value of 1,302 pounds per foot. Then I need to calculate the load um, at 8 feet from the left or from the right. And so at... 8 feet from uh, beam end. Well, I can say, okay, well, the uh, for the middle, the, the contribution from the middle beam, uh, middle diagram, and the bottom diagram is going to be the same because uh, that is the point where the uh, middle diagram maxes out and the uh, bottom diagram is constant across the entire way. So 27.7 plus the same 566.4. And all we need to do next is figure out a way of getting the uh, value of this upper uh, trapezoid, not at its maximum value of 708, but somewhere along this triangle, eight feet along. We need the value of that eight feet along the trapezoid. And to get that, all you really have to do is apply uh, similar triangles. We, we know that from zero to 10, it rises up 708. So all you have to do is multiply 708 by 8 over 10 or 4 fifths. And if you go and add all up together, I get a final value of 1161 pounds per foot. So I have my critical values and now all I need to do is plot it. And I'm going to erase these middle ones um, before I create the final plot. So let's go ahead now and create the final load diagram. And this is just going to be uh, the application of all of our individual uh, or critical values that we just got that we've spent so much time uh, carefully calculating. Okay, so our load diagram is going to have kind of an interesting shape. We have our initial values, and I'm not going to even I'm not even going to try to draw this to scale. So what these points represent is they represent points where the slope of the load diagram changes. So something kind of like that. We have kind of a barn door configuration. Something like this. So steeper slopes on the side. Well, uh, minim we have our minimum value of 27.7 pounds per foot. We have our intermediate value of 1161. And then we have our peak value of 1302. Uh, pounds per foot. And we could easily put this in kips per foot if we wanted to. And then I'll just go ahead and put in our load lines. Like so. And again, all of these are, uh, these points, what they represent, and I've gone ahead and put big dots to indicate that there are clear transition points here. Um, and in terms of dimensions, we have eight feet and then uh, two feet between uh, this point and this point. The middle of the beam will be four feet. Then another two feet between from, from the peak to the transition point. And then finally another eight feet. So yes, this is <laughs> laughably out of scale. But the key thing, uh, actually maybe I could do it a bit more. Oh, I don't know, maybe more. Like, mm. oh man, it's just getting worse. Okay, <laughs> anyway. Always hard to create precise diagrams when working on just a whiteboard or a light board in this case. 
Okay, so 1161, 1302. So we have this kind of, in case it's not clear, we have this kind of barn door or barn roof uh, configuration um, where it's, we have a break and slope and then a peak value. So we actually have one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven individual line segments that make up this full load diagram. Now, all of them are uh, linear lines, so it wouldn't be too bad to work through the statics if we, had, if we wanted to calculate the peak moments and then the uh, getting the deflections would be a little bit trickier, but uh, it wouldn't be too bad still. Okay, so that does conclude the first problem uh, we were, where we were asked to find the overall load diagram on beam EF. And you can see that when you have, um, now again, if we had a, uh, a symmetric system across uh, beam EF, in other words, if this bay BCEF was the same dimensions as bay EFHI, um, then we would have a nice, oh, tra we would still have a nice trapezoidal, um, although we'd still have that minimum load um, from the beam self weight, but uh, we would at least not have this funky barn roof kind of uh, shape here. So uh, when you have asymmetric loadings, you can very quickly get very interesting uh, load diagram shapes and it can get hairy very quickly, but that is what they pay structural engineers for. Okay, so um, hopefully that's clear um, and we're gonna go ahead and erase this and then get started on problem two. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with part two of this video. Again, in part one, we went and created uh, some basic load diagrams for our a particular beam, beam EF, combining the, the uh, area loadings from bay BCEF and bay EFHI. Now, in part two, we're going to go and calculate the load on column E. So we're going to calculate the total vertical load um, from column E, or on column E. To calculate full vertical load on column E. Now, um, so there are two main ways we could do this. Uh, now that we do have the load diagrams for, uh, or now that we do have the complete load diagram for beam EF, we could find the reactions on the ends of that beam. And then um, in turn, we could find the reaction, the full load diagram for beam uh, BE, uh, then the load diagram for beam uh, for beam DE, and finally the full load diagram for uh, beam uh, EH. Now, um, as, you, if you, as you just look at the time clock on this video though, um, you'll of course realize that it took quite a while to get the entire load diagram for column EF, or sorry, for beam EF, and while that, and while doing it that way is truly the most accurate way of doing that, there are other methods we can use. And I'm going to illustrate that method of, uh, I'm going to use a, a sort of full tributary area method when calculating the column load, uh, the total load on column uh, BE or column E, at least the uh, total vertical load. So what I want to do is now I want to, uh, so if I was going to use a pure tributary area approach, what I would want to do is to um, not have any point loads uh, considered, or in other words, not have to worry about any kind of beam reactions. So to do that, uh, I'm going to need to turn any line loads into area loads, or at least approximate um, line loads as area loads. So um, our first step, uh, actually, that would be step one, not step two. Step one. Now, what kind of loads are on this column? So the loads we're gonna have are our area dead load from the slab, the area live load from the you know, occupants and then furniture and all the sorts of things that are actually being held in the building. And then we have, so so most of the load that that, that, that column is going to experience is going to be area load. However, we still have the line loads from the beams that are framing into that column. So if we want to use a pure tributary area approach, what we would have to do is to find some approximate value for the self weight of all the beams in terms of area loads. And that's actually exactly what I'm gonna do. So um, and let me, if that's not clear, what I'm gonna, I'm, I'll just go ahead and write this out. So to perform, Oh, let's say simple tributary area uh, 
a tributary area calculation. What we want to do is to approximate, uh, let's approximate our beam weights, our beam self weight uh, in a PSF average. Okay, now that is a uh, complicated way of saying something relatively simple. So to do that, we're just gonna go ahead and find our total beam length. So our total beam length, and then just multiply by the weight of the beam per foot. So uh, I know all the dimensions, and I know there are three beams running in the horizontal direction and three in the vertical direction. So the total uh, beam length is going to be 40 feet for the beams, run that's the total length of the beams running in the horizontal direction, times, uh, there's three of those altogether that run from one side to the other, and then in the vertical direction, we have a, a beam length of 36 feet, and we again have three of those. And if I multiplied that and add that, added that correctly, I get a total beam length of 228 uh, feet. 228 feet. Uh, then, um, since I already know the weight of the beams per foot, I just need to multiply by the weight per foot to get a total uh, a total combined self weight. That's the combined self weight of all the beams in this framing system. And uh, so to get that, we can just go ahead and multiply uh, by our weight per foot. So uh, total uh, beam weight then is found just again by multiplying the total length uh, times the weight per foot, which was 27.7 pounds per foot. And if I multiply that out correctly, that comes to uh, 6,316 pounds, 6,316 pounds. Then um, I can get the, uh, if I want to get a PSF value, I'll want to go and uh, calculate, uh, I need to, I have my total load. I now need to have a area value to go with that. And the total area is simply the, the total area or the total floor area of this floor system. And that's just going to be uh, 40 feet times 36 feet. So fairly straightforward. Just multiply those together and I get an area of 1,440 square feet. And of course, all of this can be done in kilonewtons and, uh, and meters if you'd prefer. Okay, and then to get an average area load, I simply perform a pressure calculation. Pressure is simply, uh, you know, you know for, as we know from basic physics, pressure is simply force over area, so there's no reason we can't just divide the two. Again, to get an approximate value. So 14, uh, so actually 6,000, let's see here, 6,316 pounds divided by 1,440 square feet, and that will then come to a uh, PSF value uh, or an average uh, per uh, area value of 3.8, uh, 4.38 pounds per square foot, 4.38 PSF. And now we have an area load, an area, and again, a load per unit area, and we can just directly apply that in turn uh, to a tributary area to get a, co a total column load. And I do want to mention, again, I do want to reiterate, this is an approximate method. Um, if you want the most precise, accurate results, um, the best way to do that is to perform a whole, you know, a whole uh, load path calculation where you can determine uh, tributary areas of, you know, on an individual bay um, using one-way loading or two-way loading. Then you actually perform the statics on each beam individually. But uh, especially as your buildings get more complicated and larger, especially when you get to the point of dealing with, you know, real world buildings are not this simple. I mean, this, this, look at this structure. This is a, a building with just nine columns and, you know, four bays. And already we can, and we saw that what was involved in the hand calculation of, um, of just one, one beam's load diagram. And that was for the case where we just had, um, and, uh, that was the case where we haven't even started looking at things like, uh, even started looking at including things like snow load, rain load, 
or more importantly, things like load combinations um, and that sort of thing that we'll be getting at, we'll be getting to later in the course. And so this is still um, relatively simple. And we saw uh, just how complex getting that the full load diagram for one beam is. So because of that, um, often in real world building design, now obviously oftentimes or almost always you're going to be using computer software, but even hand calculations, if you want to do simple hand calculations, often it behooves you to use this kind of approximate area approach. Um, and that way also when you're running through a complex building design, um, if you change the weight of one of your beams in an iterative process, um, as long as the total weight of your beam, as long as, long as you make a semi-conservative estimate of the total weight of your beams at the start, um, you can use that as a, as a, um, as an approximation for an area load. Anyway, I just want to make clear that this is not full, correct, perfect statics, um, but this is an, uh, this is an approximate method. But um, as we'll see, the four point, if you compare this value to the other PSF values we have, it's reason it's it's not the most substantial load which shouldn't, doesn't surprise us as these are beams um which only served to, which only exist to carry the floor slab which in turn uh exist to carry the actual primary loads of the structure the live load um live load snow load wind load etc anyway so this can be a very useful tool but i do just want to uh, thoroughly emphasize that it is, this is an approximate method at its heart okay so we have that taken care of, and now we'll move on to our next step, which is to uh, get a combined service level area, and then work more with the tributary areas. But to do that, we of course will have to clear the board. There, now that we have an approximate uh, area load for our beam self-weight, let's move on to step two. And in this step, we're going to get a combined service level load. Uh, get combined service level load. And again, um, this is, uh, if you're not familiar with the term service load, this is, this of course, uh, or this again is in, um, is in the context of loads between um, service loads versus factored loads. Um, with, you know, where, where, you, where you're applying either a factor of safety or some sort of load combination. So we're talking about loads that we haven't applied any kind of um, factor on or factors in order to account for uh, risk and risk combinations. Okay, so to get this, this is going since we're all since thankfully we're all we're only dealing with service, uh, with service level loads in this problem. We can go ahead uh, to get our combined load. All we have to do is sum them together. So we have our 4.38 uh, pounds per square foot. That's our beam self weight. Uh, plus we have uh, 20.8 psf. And this is our uh, slab load, the self weight of our slab. And then we have uh, 50 pounds per square foot, which is our live load. And putting these together, we get 75.2, uh, 75.2 pounds per square feet. All right, so now notice we haven't done any kind of live load reduction on this. Um, in the, uh, if you go all the way back to the problem statement where we laid these problems out, the, uh, I said that we wanted to, I asked the problems ask, uh, telling us to look at uh, the possibility of live load reduction for the second problem. Um, and it will be more common to have live load reduction with columns uh, rather than beams because they have uh, larger tributary areas. Anyway, so before we can investigate the possibility of live load reduction, we first need to determine a tributary area for this column. And this is going to be fairly, uh, fairly uh, intuitive, I think. We have this middle column, so to get the tributary area for it, all we have to do is divide, um, is divide the slab around the column into, uh, into uh, halfway points. And then, um, and then simply uh, find the total area therein. So in case that's not clear, let me just start writing a few things out. So uh, again, for part three, we're going to determine, or for step three, we're going to determine uh, the tributary area of column E. Uh, 
Circle of column E. So to do that, now I'm going to draw out column E. Uh, so we have column E here. And then we have our beam lines going out to the other columns. And that's all well and good, except I don't want to consider the area all the way to them. What I want to do instead is take the halfway dimensions. And this probably, of course, isn't, again, isn't to scale. Uh, in terms of dimensions, pay attention to those. 8 feet, 12 feet, and um, then we're going to have 8 feet and 10 feet. So um, here, if you want to know where these numbers came from, Again, look at column E. Uh, trace your eye downward to column H, and then, uh, I mean, uh, I should say, look at column E on the diagram on the uh, left side of the board. There's a reason that I left this diagram up here. Uh, look at column E, and then with your eye, trace down to column H. And then look to the right, and you'll see that the dimension is 24 feet there. Well, what I've done is I have simply taken the area that corresponds to half that width, because um, I only want half of that slab um, uh, to the right of uh, column E. And so when we half that dimension, we in turn got 12 feet. So, the, so this represents the actual area of the column we're considering. Or if I wanted to draw this out, I could say our tributary area is this here. And that's where the 12 feet, uh, 8 feet, 10 feet, and I could draw the rest of these dimensions out too. This is 12 feet. Uh, it's, it's going to be simple because then it's going to be uh, the same because it's a simple rectangle. 8 feet, 8 feet, and then 8 feet and 10 feet. Again, each of these is simply the halfway dimension of the, uh, of the particular bay that it's on. Okay, and so if we then go and, and find the total area of this, that's not too hard. Our tributary area then is going to be 20 feet times 18 feet, which is total width by total length, and that comes to a value of 360 square feet. So in other words, this column, column E, is going to be carrying 360, uh, 360 square feet worth of, um, 360 square feet worth of dead load, 360 square feet versus worth of live load, uh, 360 square feet of beam self-weight, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have our tributary area, and then our next part is going to be, our next step is going to be uh, uh, investigating more deeply uh, to see whether we can apply uh, live load reduction. Okay, so uh, our next step is going to be to check if live load reduction applies. So our next step, again, is to determine or check if live load reduction, I'll just call it LLR, applies. And you may recall that for, um, for regular live load, not roof live load, but regular live load, the reduction um, procedure is to do KLL times AT um, to calculate that and then see if that is over square, uh, 400 square feet where the KLL factor, again, is a factor found in ASC 7, and that is to uh, that is basically a member factor uh, that, um, depending on what type of member you have, column, beam, etc., and where that given element is, whether, whether uh, and some other structural context uh, idea, some other structural context um, considerations. Um, and from that, you get a KLL factor, and the KLL factor for an interior column is 4.0. Uh, for an interior column is simply 4.0. Therefore, our KLL times AT um, is going to be, for in this case, will be 4 times our tributary area of 360 feet squared, and that in turn then comes to a value of 1440 square feet which in fact is greater than 400 square feet. So for something like a beam, it, you often won't get uh, KL factors, um, you won't, often won't get tributary areas large enough to, to allow live load reduction. 
but of course, depending on the actual spe uh, specifics of the building, you certainly can, which is why there are KLL factors for that. But you're more likely, just simply due to the um, higher KLL factor for, say, an interior column, and because of the higher uh, tributary errors that, uh, that columns experience, um, you're more likely to apply libel reduction to a column than a, a beam, perhaps. Okay, so next, uh, let's go ahead and, so we have now determined that we are allowed to reduce our live load. And again, the whole idea of live load reduction is simply the idea that, um, is simply the idea that if we apply that live loads from code, that code value live loads, the value you get when you look up in a table, the, uh, the live load pounds per square foot from say, uh, you know, an interior bedroom or a, a, you know, a household bedroom or an apartment or a uh, library stacks or hallways or a classroom. Those table values, when you apply, uh, they are reasonably accurate for um, the worst case scenario that a room might experience over its lifetime, but they tend to be, um, but if applied across the entire area of a building, they become quite large and uh, in, in many ways unrealistic. So uh, let's go ahead and calculate the reduced live load. And that's going to be L equals L naught. The formula for this is L equals L naught times 0 0.25 um, plus 15 divided by the square root of KLL AT. KLL times AT, I should say, like so. And uh, put, uh, substituting in our appropriate numbers, our unreduced live load uh, that was given to us was 50 pounds per square foot times uh, all of our relative, uh, our, all of our relevant uh, terms, 0 0.25 plus 15 divided by the square root of KLL um, times AT. We already have calculated that KLL times AT is 1,440 feet squared. And this is one, again, one of those lovely empirical equations that um, there are equations in ASC 7 for uh, SI units, but I'm just using the more common English units, uh, at, least more com uh, at least more common in an American context. And if you're using ASC 7, well, you're probably in an American context or similar. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. I get a final reduced live load value, assuming I did the math correctly, of 32.3 pounds per square foot. All right, um, okay, so there's that, and we are almost done. Our final step is going to be to calculate the uh, total area load. Uh, to calculate, well, actually, that won't be the final step. That will be the uh, uh, second to final step. Getting a little ahead of ourselves here. We'll be to calculate the total area load. And that will simply be the summation of all of these. So remember, we are we already calculated a total area load before, but there we calculated it uh, with the unreduced live load. So it will be useful to compare the two of them. So uh, the second to final step, let's do 4.38. That is again the self weight of the beams. Then we have plus 20.8. That is the uh, that is the self weight of the slab, and then plus our reduced live load. 32.3, and that comes to 57.4 PSF. Now let's go and compare that to the uh, previous unreduced total. So the previous unreduced total was 75.2 uh, PSF. And this is substantial. This is not, live load reduction, is, there's a reason um, the uh, specifications on codes allow you to do this. Um, or the re there's a reason that um, there has been a desire to get these implement implemented into the code. Remember, we are going to take this uh, area load and directly multiply it by our tributary area to get our column axial load. And that, and think about, look at those numbers, 57.4 versus 75.2. When you're talking, and that number is going to be directly proportional to our final column load. Each of those numbers will be. 
So reducing it from 75 to 57, that is a substantial reduction, which, re which in turn represents a substantial reduction in um, column sizes, column area, connection sizes, connection complexity, et cetera, et cetera. The smaller, smaller uh, uh, area loads inevitably map directly to redu reduce cross sections, reduce costs, et cetera. So um, this does have a, so if you, uh, so if you are using those higher loads, now, uh, if you do do that, you're of course not wrong in the in the pure um, in the pure physics sense or whatnot. Um, you're not uh, going, or and also you're not going to hurt anyone by doing that. Um, no one is going to physically come to harm by doing that. But of course, you're designing your structure much less efficient than you could otherwise. And we we again come back to that old adage that anyone can design anyone can design a bridge that will stand up. It takes an engineer to design one that will barely stand up. Okay. Now that I'm, I'll, I'll get up, go ahead and get off my soapbox and finish the stupid problem. So a total column load. Our total column load then is simply going to be our tributary area times our, uh, our total area load. And that's that 57.4, we're going to use that. We, we have chosen to go ahead and use the reduced value. So our overall axial load, maybe like a capital P for that, would be 360 square feet, our tributary area. Now note, we are using the tributary area, the actual dimension, not the KLL times AT area. That KLL eight times AT is only used for live load reduction calculations. Uh, when, you act, when you want to get your actual load uh, on your tributary area, your actual vertical load, you do not include, you do not use that KLL value, you don't, oh my god, you do not use that KLL times AT value, you simply use the actual physical tributary area. And now, if I can uh, quit being tongue-tied, uh, 360 feet squared times our value of 57.4 pounds per square foot, and we get a value of 20.7 kips. And I, of course, have converted pounds to kips by dividing by 1,000. All right, and that concludes that problem. So as a review for this problem, what have we done? We have, um, we have first determined a tributary area for the column by just doing a simple diagram and dividing out the slab into the, the, whole, or the whole floor slab into tributary areas of various columns. And we found, and we did that by just dividing along halfway lines uh, between adjacent columns. We determined the tributary area. And then um, in order to run everything as uh, or by a complete tributary area method, we went and um, uh, we went and determined an average per area weight for all of our uh, beams. That allowed us to use a pure tributary area method um, for the entire uh, process in determining the axial load on the column. So we did that, we got an area load for our beams, we got a, uh, a tributary area, we determined whether we could use um, a tributary area, or sorry, a live load reduction or not. We found out that we could, and then we used that reduced value and multiplied a tributary area times a, uh, a, a total area load, and that at last, gives us our final service level um, total column load, which is 20.7 kips. If I did the math correctly, which, and if I didn't make a math mistake, which of course is certainly possible, I advise you to check these numbers as well. Anyway, I hope you found this uh, video uh, interesting or at least a bit informative. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me or leave them below. Uh, I'll see you all again soon for the next video in this series. And as always, thank you.